tell her what you need. Jump into the first one. Rolling, speed, action. Sawbuck's looking a little chubby wubby. So I bought him some new food. It's organic and vegan. <sighs> Dogs are supposed to eat meat. They're descendants of wolves. You ever see a vegan wolf on the Nature Channel? I'm a vegan. <laughs> Coffee is for closers, ladies. Listen up. Hey, don't make this a prison hug. I'm a heteronormative, cisgendered white male. For which I apologize. I'm black, and that used to be enough. But I'm also bilingual, and I'm non-binary. We're the Army. We drink more before 9 a.m. than you Navy pukes do all day. He rubbed all the fur off his emotional support ferret. The damn thing looked like a four-legged penis. Charity and work. Two words that should never go together. Like women and opinions. I want a burly man. They're salty and make me dizzy. Sorry, just need to find a thingy to fix my gaming chair. When I was on the construction site, my chair was a five-gallon bucket. It was also my toilet. <laughs> hey, I'm done. I'm going back to bed. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, that was the trailer for Mr. Burcham. And uh, as promised, we've got Adam Carolla, comedian extraordinaire. You've seen him over the years all over the place. And uh, it's great to see this character coming to life uh, again this way with this amazing cast. I'm just looking at it here. You've got Adam Carolla, Megan Kelly, uh, Brett Cooper, Sage Steele, Roseanne Barr, Danny Trejo, so many. Uh, Adam Carolla, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Rich. You bet. So tell me about this. I see the Daily Wire is involved in it, and I think it's it's awesome that it's happening. But how did the uh, idea come about, and what what was the, I guess, the impetus for saying, let's bring this, this idea to life? Well, it's a very old idea. I had a character that I created right right about the 30th anniversary, right about now. So it's been, been a lot of years. Uh, it initially got me into radio by doing a character on the Kevin and Bean Morning Show out here in Los Angeles on wow. K-Rock Radio. And it became very popular, and people really took to it, even though it was just over the radio. And it became a little bit of a sensation, and then I got signed to William Morris, and then Jimmy and I broke off from K-Rock Radio, and we started doing The Man Show, and mm -hmm. Crank Yankers, and many other um, endeavors. And uh, then the character just sort of sloughed off because I used the character to get me into show business. And then once I got into show business, it became a lot of love line and late night show hosts and, you know, TV mm -hmm. shows and stuff like that. It had nothing to do with Bertram. Um, but it was always in the back of my head and, and people would periodically come up to me and they would go, oh, that Bertram, man, that's the funniest thing you've ever done. And I would go, oh, okay, but that was years ago. And now I'm on to other stuff. And they'd go, you got to bring back Bertram, you know, but I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and then about 11 or 12 years ago, we did it as a pilot for Fox television and they didn't pick it up because it was probably, you know, it was over a decade ago and maybe we were a little too early for a lot of the stuff he was saying. Uh, but then the winds blew a little different direction and policies and political things changed and then all of a sudden it became a good idea again to revisit Mr. Burcham. So we brought it to uh, the Daily Wire and uh, they said, yeah, we like it. And the next thing you know, we're in the animation business. That's fantastic. I, I, I mean, it, it's it, the trailer's hysterical because it, it kind of, uh, you know, shows you the behind the scenes of everybody voicing this stuff. Uh, but when when you you look back and again, I thought this was like, you know, from the crank yankers era, you're saying it came all the way from the beginning of, of radio, which is really cool. So it, 30 years in the making and and it's back. What what was it um, about now that says, all right, let's bring Bertram back? Um, everybody who was exposed to Bertram thought he was a funny character and it was a good idea and it was a kind of a modern day Archie Bunker, uh, <laughs> right. all in the family kind of situation. And, and it just took a while for people to sort of wrap their minds around it. And also, you know, there weren't entities like Daily Wire, uh, 
several mm-hmm. years ago. You know, there you kind of had your choice between, you know, Fox Animation and they were sort of thinking about Bob's Burgers and Family Guy and stuff like that. This didn't really fit and it needed a platform that was kind of simpatico with Burcham, like a, like a platform that went, I agree with what Burcham yeah. is saying versus Fox, who would have disagreed with what Burcham was saying. Yeah, I, I listen to, to to the clips that I've heard of Burcham, and and uh, he reminds me of a, of an older brother that I have, <laughs> and and I'm thinking you probably hear that from a lot of people saying, "Oh, he sounds like an uncle." Is there a real life Burcham in your life that you based him on, or is he like a a, a combination of of curmudgeons that you've met over the years? He is uh, an amalgamation of all the shop teachers I had in junior <laughs> high. Big, forearmed, angry guys with mustaches who liked the subject of woodworking or metal shop, but really hated the kids. And it always stuck in my head, even as a young person going to uh, Walter Reed Junior High in North Hollywood, California, I was like, it is kind of ironic that these guys go every day, they show up to school with a classroom full of kids, but they hate kids. And, but yet here they are every day but they love woodworking and they love a shop, a free shop with band saws and lathes and table saws. So I it always, even at a, as a young, of a young lad, it kind of stuck in my head that this is a funny juxtaposition that there's these guys that are school teachers, but they hate their clients essentially, which are kids. It's so funny. As you're saying that, uh, it reminded me of my own shop teacher, a little burly guy, Ernie Tabacino. And I remember right. somebody got stupid with him in class one day and I thought he was going to kick him out of class, send him to the vice principal. And he stepped up right in his face, face to face. And he looked at the kid and he said, listen, kid, I'll rip your heart out. <laughs> And I was right. like, I believe them. <laughs> so that was Burcham. That's fantastic. Folks, we're on with Adam Carolla. And uh, he's uh, the the voice, the star of this Mr. Burcham that's coming out on Daily Wire. And Adam Carolla, this this um, casting, tell me about casting and how you guys came up with the cast. Was it Daily Wire? Was it you? Did you put the whole thing together? You've got a lot of people in there. Yeah, it was kind of a combination of people I knew, relationships I had, people I thought, oh, this guy would be great. You know, Jay Moore's a friend and Megan Kelly's a friend. And, you know, some people that were friends, Roseanne was an acquaintance slash friend. And mm-hmm. so there were like some people are as Rob Riggle's a friend and there are people where I went, oh, I think we should get these guys. I mean, they're world-class VO guys. Um, and, and actors and actresses, you know, and I thought, well, we could do that. So I'll reach out to some of these people who maybe daily, daily wire doesn't have a relationship with some of these guys, but then there are other people that they do have a relationship with that they've worked with in the past and they'll reach out to those people. And so it was a kind of a happy surprise that some, all the people they reached out to, I, I thought, oh, these guys were great. I don't, I never even heard of some of these people, but here they are. And then other people, names, people I've been knocking around with in this town for 25, 30 years, uh, they stepped up as well. So it was a, it was a kind of happy marriage. Nice. Folks, we're on with Adam Carolla talking about his new animated series on the Daily Wire, Mr. Burcham. And uh, if you missed the trailer, make sure you check it out. Adam Carolla, the world famous Adam Carolla. I, I grew up watching Adam Carolla for sure. Adam and Dr. Drew, Love Lines, all of that stuff. It was it was amazing. And Adam Carolla, if you don't mind, in this segment, I want to uh, we'll continue to talk about Mr. Bertram because uh, I feel like he's the uncle, uh, my long lost uncle. But I want to get a little biographical with you and uh, tell us a little about your story. I know you started in radio and and you've had quite a journey. Uh, a year or two ago, you were doing a tour with Prager, which I thought was fantastic. Um, tell us about this journey. Well, I started off just sort of middle class poor in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. And uh, I was just sort of a jock and played football and baseball and and um, got out of high school. And I, I, I didn't go to college. I just went to a construction site and dug ditches and moved drywall and cleaned up trash and, you know, that that kind of stuff. And I then eventually learned the trade of carpentry 
And uh, so I just drove a pickup truck and, you know, had an apartment and roommates and um, swung a hammer during the day and lived, you know, pretty pedestrian, sort of middle poor kind of kind of life. And there wasn't a lot of perks or vacation days or bonuses or insurance or there wasn't anything. I was just kind of going from one job site to the next job site and, you know, making nine bucks or 12 bucks an hour or something. And uh, it started to kind of dawn on me that this wasn't really going to be much of a life, um, that it was hard work and there weren't any, you know, you'd get off for Christmas day, but you wouldn't get paid for Christmas day. I wasn't in a union. I wasn't in a guild. You know, I wasn't in anything. I was just gun for hire, 12 bucks an hour and uh, no insurance and uh, no perks. So I I was like, well, you know, I I think I'd like to own a home and have a bank account and a savings account and a retirement account and medical and dental and insurance and uh, a credit card and a mortgage that I could pay and savings and, and stuff. I didn't have anything. So I was like, I, maybe there's some other business that I could start thinking about that might pay and and might have, you know, maybe there's a business where they have a lunch, they bring you lunch or something like that, you know, <laughs> cause you know, I was eating lunch off a taco truck on a pile of drywall every day, you know? And I was like, well, and I was hearing about other people that had, you know, jobs with vacation days or bonuses or perks, you know, Christmas parties and stuff like that. And so I was like, well, what, you know, what, what, what else can you do? And it, I, I wasn't going to be a lawyer. I wasn't going to be a doctor. I wasn't going to work at an advertising firm. I, I could barely read or write. I wasn't really educated. So I was like, well, I think you're funny. So maybe start working on that. And you know, if you work on being funny, maybe there's some kind of job in the future where you get to do that, you know, and work indoors and have some air conditioning and, and have a normal kind of career, you know, a career, not a job and have lunch. (laughs) And, um, so I just started pecking away at comedy and it, and I knew it would take a long time and I knew I didn't know anything and I didn't have stand up. I started doing open mic stand up, but I wasn't really good at it. And I didn't really have my voice down. And it just, I didn't take to it. It wasn't mm. a natural thing for me. And it's I really just hard. didn't have an, it, it's, I certainly made it look hard <laughs> back in the day, you know? <laughs> so uh, the audience thought it was hard when I hit the stage, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, and so I started focusing on sketch and improv and, um, group improv and, and, and joining groups, the groundlings, Acme theater and stuff like that. So I really started getting an experience in sketch, writing sketches, acting out the sketches and and doing improv. And so then I became very well trained at that, but that really wasn't a stepping stone to make any money. So now I'd had all this training, but no real application for it. So how do you how do you make the um, the, the the leap from improv and sketch comedy into radio when you're looking for a lunch? Right. Because There's not always lunch in radio. No, there there isn't. There isn't lunch in radio, but there is you get to do comedy and you get to do it indoors and there's air <laughs> conditioning and there's no drywall. Seat. Just having a seat, a chair, <laughs> uh, an indoor bathroom instead of a porta potty, you know, like these were all everything was gravy to me, you know, being right. in, in, in inside with some temperature control. Um, I was a boxing coach for a period of time and I'd while while I was a carpenter and I'd heard that they were going to have a boxing match between Jimmy the sports guy and Michael the maintenance man on on the K-Rock radio station as part of a morning stunt. And I became determined to train one of them to box as their trainer. And I thought that maybe I could see the inside of the radio station or or make my way in somehow 
and in, somehow ingratiate myself into this morning show that I could possibly be a part of, but I would use my my position as a boxing trainer to sort of get my foot in the door. And and did it work? Did you get in? Yeah, I, I, I showed up at the radio station and I sort of waited in the hall and I told someone I was a boxing coach and they went inside the radio station because I couldn't get inside the radio station. And then at some point, uh, a guy came down the hall, 26 year old guy, and he was Jimmy the sports guy, and that turned out to be Jimmy Kimmel. Wow. What a story. Uh, I know that you toured with uh, Prager a couple of years back, Dennis Prager, uh, talking about lots of interesting things. And I was a, you know, he's this uh, conservative intellectual, and, and you were this uh, now conservative um, Hollywood feature icon. And uh, it was an interesting pair, in, in my opinion, and I think it was, um, I'm sure, a largely successful tour. Uh, but fast forward, here we are. Um, so many of the things you were talking about then are, are probably worse now. Uh, give me your take on on how you see things uh, culturally, politically in America these days. Well, I mean, we're divided, obviously. I don't know that one side is going to talk the other side out of what they know. Mm -hmm. On one side, I would say the conservatives you're going to have a hard time talking the conservatives out of what they know. And I think on the other side, you're going to have a hard time talking the progressives out of how they feel. So you got one group that knows something and you got another group that feels something and the group that feels something it's, it's even more powerful than the people who know something or have the information, you know? So I don't know that one side is going to get the other side to talk, you know, anybody with a teenage daughter, good luck talking her out of how she feels. That's how <laughs> she feels. You know what I mean? And I feel that way about most of the people in California. They feel a certain way. They felt a certain way about COVID. They were wrong about all of it, but they yeah. felt that way. And they felt that way violently, you know, and there was no data no studies or no anything that was going to disavow them of how, how they felt. So I think it's going to come to a point, which we're sort of in the middle of, of, of a self segregation that um, if you don't like the way things are running and you don't like the way you're being governed or taxed or policed or whatever it is, or God forbid there's another COVID comes down the pike you're going to have to just relocate to a place that is more in line with the way you, with the things you know and, the, and how you feel. And I think there's going to be, you know, I live in California and everyone I talk to is talking about getting out, going to Florida, going to Texas, going to Nevada. So they're just going to self-segregate. I don't, I don't think I'm going to sit around in California and try to talk Gavin Newsom out of how he feels. He feels a certain way. Yeah. He's incorrect, but that's how he feels. And it's, and there's going to be no turning that ship around. Now he's going to run California into the ground and then he'll need something from the places where people fled to, which will be the next step. But for now, I think, uh, safe spaces and octagons, as I always tell Dr. Drew, like he goes, where are we going? I go, well, octagon, you know, Florida's an octagon and California's a safe space and we're just going to self-segregate. Now, presuming that's the case, and I, I think you're right, the writing's on the wall, that's definitely happening. How does that end up? Do you think, um, you know, everybody that's super progressive leaves whatever red state they're in and goes to California, some sort of pilgrimage? Or do they make it their business to to take over, you know, to make it the next Austin, right? You know, Austin was once red, now it's blue. Uh, they took Colorado some years ago, and it's been blue for since. D do you think that they continue to, I don't know, proselytize and try and take over more red states? I think there's always that attempt, like any nutball religion, which is essentially <laughs> what progressivism is. Yeah. Um, but I don't think, they're that self-destructive. Like 
the people, let's just say you're progressive and you're very blue and you live in Texas and you live or Florida, as an example. Um, you complain a lot about the governor. You complain a lot about policy. You complain a lot about abortion. You complain a lot about a lot of stuff. But it's safe and you like it there. <laughs> and you want to come move to California and pay 13% in state taxes and live amongst the homeless and the chaos, go right ahead. But I don't see anybody doing that. They like that, you know, there, there are plenty, you know, there's little bastions of, um, of conservatism in Southern California. There's, um, Orange County. Mm -hmm. Orange County is clean. Orange County is safe and it's orderly. And there are probably plenty of people who live in Orange County that are left wing and Democrats, um, but they live in a safe, orderly place. <laughs> <laughs> and they like that those, it's clean. Right. Those hypocrites ain't moving to Los Angeles to live amongst the chaos and the homeless. So Fish they may the think this way, but they ain't showing it with their feet. They're not moving here. People are leaving L.A. and going to Orange County because at the end of the day, they want a school system that works. They want a police force that's present. They want safety. They want cleanliness. They want no homeless. They want all the things that come along with the red leaning cities. Now, let's talk about uh, you mentioned Gavin Newsom. A lot of people say that he, he's got a lot of presidential aspiration. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does. What do you think uh, transpires? Joe, I like to call him Joe El Baboso Biden. This guy doesn't know if he's coming or going, but he relies on a lot of muscle memory from his days as a corrupt, crooked uh, senator. W what do you think happens? Do you think they pull a switcheroo at the convention? Does he actually run against Trump? Does he make it all the way through? Does he just get beat? Say, sorry, I couldn't do it. Well, how do you see that playing out? I don't think uh, Gavin Newsom can run on his record. He he doesn't seem to understand that California is kind of the laughing stock of the union. You know, <laughs> he he has run California into the ground, and now he wants. You know, he basically ran the world's worst burger joint, and now he wants to franchise. And people are saying, "We've tasted your burgers. We don't want you to franchise. <laughs> exactly. We don't want you in our state." And there's this bizarre thought he is not going to play well in the middle of the country they look at him as some sort of dipsy do kind of hippie pine the sky idiot who's all about you know transgender the transgender movement who's sunk 24 billion dollars into the homeless situation and made it worse california is the punchline of, of uh, the joke that most of the country is telling. So um, I don't see that he works on any kind of national scale. All they have to do is point to the, you know, he's currently running a state and he's running it into the ground. So why would anybody right. want that sort of governance on a larger scale? Now, do you think Biden makes it through? Do you think uh, Trump beats him? What do you think the future of the country looks like? I, I think, you know, if you would ask me a year ago, I probably said, oh, Biden will be gone by now. But it appears like he's going to push through. Uh, I think Trump will beat him. But who knows what shenanigans are in store? Who knows yeah. if there's some sort of COVID 2.0 or flu. Russia, Russia launches a, a nuke at Taiwan or something. I mean, be prepared for something. I, I do not suspect that the Democrats are going to just go, look, Marquis of Queensberry, two men enter the ring. One man has his hand raised. We'll see who the better man is. We'll check the ballot box. I don't I can't see them doing that. They don't like to. There are them. they are going to do something. Now I don't know if it's a steel dossier, Russian collusion, and I don't know if it's monkeypox, but it's something. They're not going to just sit around. If Trump is ahead by eight points and all the swing states going into the election, they're not just going to go let 
let the populace cast their vote and let the chips fall where they may. There, there's going to be something. I mean, they're going to be the usual, you know, racist and you know, authoritarian dictator. And, you know, you know uh, blacks and gays are going to be rounded up and put into gulags. There's going to be all that talk <laughs> for sure. He's going to start a gay gulag, but <laughs> worst prison job, worst prison guard job in the world. <laughs> Working at the gay they gulag. only do diversity but, hires for that job. Oh, good. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> you may be hanging in the balance, but, but something they're not, they're not going to let it go. There's going to be right. something. And I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if it's a terrorist attack. I don't know, but they're not just going to go let the people decide. Uh, that I'm I'm fairly sure of. Now, Adam Carolla, let everybody know how they can uh, keep up to speed with all of the great things you're doing, whether it's Mr. Burcham, your show, and everything else you're up to. You can go to uh, adamcarolla.com, listen to the podcast for free. See, I do live stand-up shows all over the country. Go to Daily Wire and check out Daily Wire Plus, I should say, and check out Burcham. I got books on Amazon. I'm sort of everywhere. But if you go to Adam Carolla, adamcarolla.com, you should find everything you're looking for. Folks, check out the Adam Carolla Show. Check out adamcarolla.com. Don't miss Mr. Burcham on D Daily Wire Plus. Adam Carolla, you are a gentleman, a scholar, and a patriot. And I'm grateful that you stayed up late to talk with us today. Thanks, Rich.